For more physics related videos, please subscribe. In this video, we're going to try to explain why the Earth has the temperature that it has. And while we're at it, we're going to do the rest of the planets as well. I've rated the physics level in this video as easiest. We're going to start from the position that the only thing we know about the Earth is that it's in a solar system orbiting this very hot object called the Sun, which is constantly shining light on it. So from this point of view, we would expect that planets that are closer to the Sun are hotter than planets that are further away from the Sun. So in this very simple model, the Earth is just heated by the Sun. The other thing you have to realize is that the Earth also emits some radiation, so it loses some heat. And we're going to make one other assumption, which is that the Earth is in thermal equilibrium. So this just means that there is no net heat absorption or emission. So that means that the heat absorbed by the Sun will have to equal the heat emitted by the Earth. And we're assuming that all this heat, either emitted or absorbed, comes in the form of radiation. So, if this is the Sun, and we have the Earth at some distance r from the Sun, the Sun emits a fixed amount of radiation. By the time it gets to the Earth, that radiation has to be spread out over a sphere whose radius is the distance between the Sun and the Earth. And the fraction of that radiation that the Earth will receive is the fraction of the area that the Earth occupies on the sphere. Now, there's nothing special about the Earth, so this should hold for other planets. So, for example, if we took Mars, which is a little bit further away from the Earth, now the same amount of radiation has to be spread out over a larger sphere. But let's ignore other planets for now and just focus on the Earth. So, now the power absorbed, which is just the energy the Earth absorbs per second, is going to be the power that the Sun emits, which is usually called its luminosity, but it's the same thing divided by the surface area of this sphere of radius capital R, and then times the cross-sectional area of the Earth. I'm saying approximate here because, if you recall from the previous slide, part of the light that shines on the Earth is actually reflected. But that's a minor correction, and this is a pretty coarse-grained model, so I'm going to ignore that for now. Since the Earth is basically a sphere, its cross-sectional area is just the area of a circle with the radius of the Earth. We can cancel out the pi's, and we find that the power absorbed by the Earth due to the Sun is the Sun's luminosity times the radius of the Earth squared divided by four times the distance between the Earth and the Sun squared. Now remember we said that the Earth also emits some radiation, and we have to figure out what that is. And what we're going to do is we're going to assume the Earth is a black body. If you don't know what a black body is, it's an object that emits radiation in all colors of light. And it turns out that the power emitted by a black body is known, and it's equal to a constant, which is called the Stefan-Boltzmann constant, which is usually written as sigma, times the surface temperature to the fourth, times the surface area of the black body. So that means that the power emitted by the Earth is approximately sigma times the surface temperature of the Earth to the fourth, times the surface area of the Earth, which is a sphere, so that's just 4 pi r squared, little r squared in this case. Now notice again I've said approximately, and that's for multiple reasons. One, the Earth is not a perfect black body. And two, and probably more importantly, is that the Earth's surface doesn't have a fixed temperature. It varies with location. It heats up during the day and cools down at night and it changes over the period of a year, and it might even change over long geological timescales. So this temperature that we're using is some sort of average surface temperature, which is kind of a vague concept. Okay, now that we know how much power is absorbed and how much is emitted, since we're assuming that the Earth is in thermal equilibrium, these two powers have to be equal to one another. The little r squareds cancel, and solving for t, we get that the average surface temperature of the Earth should be about the Sun's luminosity divided by 16 pi sigma capital R squared, all raised to the 1 fourth. If you're enjoying this video so far, please like and subscribe, and consider sharing it with a few friends. I'm now going to take this quantity here, which I'm circling in pink, and call it alpha to the fourth. This is just a constant, it's a number, and if you plug in the values, you'll find that it's about 278 Kelvin, 
AUs to the one half. An AU is an astronomical unit, which is defined as the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So now we can rewrite our expression for the temperature as alpha divided by the square root of capital R. Now there's nothing special about the Earth, and so capital R could just be the distance between any planet and the Sun, as long as it's measured in AUs. Now that we have an expression for the average temperature of a planet as a function of its distance from the Sun, we can plug in some numbers and see how this works. The Earth, by definition, is at a distance of 1 AU, so that means that the average temperature of the Earth should be about 278 Kelvin, which is equal to 5 degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty good. It's certainly in the ballpark of reasonable temperatures found on Earth. According to NASA's website, the average temperature of the surface of the Earth is about 288 Kelvin, or 15 degrees Celsius, or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it's a little warmer than we predicted. But still, we're definitely in the ballpark. Maybe we just got lucky with the Earth, so let's see how it works with other planets. I went ahead and plotted this expression for temperature as a function of distance. The circular dots are the predicted temperatures of the planets and the square dots are the actual temperatures of the planets, according to NASA. As we can see, this model does pretty well. Jupiter and Saturn are a little bit off. One of the reasons for this is because they're made of gas, they don't really have a clear, well-defined surface. This is also a problem if the planet has an atmosphere, because when we model the planets as a black body, the location of the surface is actually the place where radiation leaves the Earth into space. And if you have an atmosphere, that's also not very well defined. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but there is one glaring problem here, which is Venus, which is way off by about 400 degrees. So what's going on here? Well, Venus has a very thick atmosphere. And as a result, it's got a very strong greenhouse effect, trapping heat and significantly increasing its temperature. In fact, this also explains why our predicted temperature for the Earth is a little bit lower than what's measured. So what have we found? The Sun, under normal circumstances, is actually the primary determinant of the temperature of a planet. If the planet has a very thick atmosphere, and depending on the contents of that atmosphere, that may no longer be the case. But for the most part, this model works pretty well to get a rough estimate. Now remember, we said that the Earth has an atmosphere, and so this brings up the question of, when we say the temperature of the surface of the Earth, where exactly are we talking about? If we plot the temperature of the Earth as a function of altitude, it changes quite a bit, and the number we found sits right about here on this green line. And so we can see there's a problem of when we say the surface of the Earth has a temperature of 278 Kelvin, where exactly are we talking about in the atmosphere? Another glaring problem that we already brought up is that the Earth is not actually in thermal equilibrium. Its temperature changes as a function of time, heats up during the day and cools down at night. It also changes on longer timescales over the course of a year, and it changes over geological timescales. But even over geological time, the temperature changes by about plus or minus 10 degrees Celsius. So even then, we're still in the right ballpark. Now I want to point out, if we go back to our expression for alpha, notice that it depends on the luminosity of the sun. So if that changes, if the sun were to say get hotter or cooler, that would also affect the temperature of the earth, but not because the distance from the earth to the sun has changed, but because the sun's output has changed. So now we can do something a little more interesting with this equation we can use it to find what's called the Goldilocks zone, which is the habitable zone for a planet. And so if we know the luminosity of some star, we can figure out how far away a planet has to be to likely be able to support life. This is assuming that atmospheric effects of that planet are subdominant. So to do that, all we got to do is replace the luminosity of the sun, which was in our constant alpha, with the luminosity of the star. And so we can rewrite our function for temperature in the following way. The temperature of a planet will be about 278 Kelvin 
times the luminosity of the star measured in units of solar luminosities, all raised to the one-fourth, divided by the square root of the distance from the planet and the star measured in units of AUs, all raised to the one-half. There are a number of factors that go into determining the Goldilocks zone, but probably the most important one is whether it can have liquid water. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe, and stay tuned for the next video where we're going to figure out how far away is the horizon. Be sure to hit the bell to be notified for the release of this video. Thanks for watching.